Every E3, or increasingly every Game Awards or generic publisher focus showcase, something fascinating happens. Microsoft will show a gorgeous landscape that suddenly gets sports cars driving over it, or Sony will start playing jazz over a shot of some stripy curb as a Forza or a Gran Turismo takes centre stage. At this point, the audience on Twitter or in the livestream collectively groans and goes to take a toilet break. Racing games, who even cares? It turns out, a lot of people. There's a reason there are so many games in the genre, and that's because they tend to sell exceptionally well. In fact, to ask anyone what the best-selling first-party PlayStation franchise is, and you'll likely get a lot of wrong answers. God of War? Uncharted? No, none of those. It's actually Gran Turismo. No, I'm not joking. What on earth is the appeal, though? Who's playing this stuff? Well, I'm in an interesting position because while I rarely get excited to see a racing game in a showcase, there is a non-zero chance that I may end up playing one of them at some point. If you don't believe me, then you didn't watch my Games of the Year video which placed a racing game right at number one. And because I'm still playing that racing game and because Gran Turismo 7 launches this week, I decided to celebrate the genre from my weird position of someone who isn't super into motorsports, but also doesn't entirely switch off when Microsoft lowers a car from the ceiling. I'll be looking back through the racing games I've enjoyed and what makes them so appealing to me, and trying to show why there's enjoyment to be had in the genre, even when you think a drivetrain is what a London underground worker does for a living. I'm Bob the Pet Ferret, this is Games Are Good, a show all about celebrating the great aspects of video games, and today we'll be looking at why racing games are a rally good time. I've explained in other videos that as a child I exclusively played cutesy platformers, usually those based on cartoons I liked. So my exposure to racing games took a while, but the seeds were planted early on regardless because, like many boys, I spent a lot of my childhood playing with toy cars. I remember being very good at memorising the makes and models of most vehicles around me, and loved nothing more than racing scaled down miniature vehicles across the living room. So it's perhaps unsurprising that one of my earliest memories of visiting an arcade, most likely during a seaside resort holiday, was playing Outrun. That love of toy cars drew me directly to the cabinet with a steering wheel and a sleek car. I was terrible at it, and I still am, but there was still something undeniably cool about driving a Ferrari down an impossibly long road to... somewhere. Racing games still saw a minimal presence in my actual collection though, with the greatest exposure I had to the genre being Super Mario Kart at a friend's house. I mean, that's also excellent, but for some reason I still wasn't super interested in getting it myself. Hell, to this day, the only other Mario Karts I've played have been the DS title and a tiny bit of Mario Kart 8 on the Switch. I've honestly played a lot more Crash Team Racing, if I'm being honest with you here. But as I moved into my early teens and Tomb Raider opened my mind to appreciating a wider world of video games, an old toy obsession transferred over. After all, one of the toy car lines I often played with as a kid was the Micro Machines range. If you're somehow unfamiliar, the name should give an indication of what's going on here, as they were super tiny toy cars that were perfect for child hands to mess around with. And that's how I found myself playing Micro Machines V3, a game that emulated the joy of rolling extremely small toy cars over dinner tables and carpets. The game was a goofy time, with settings ranging from a breakfast table, a living room, a posh dinner table, a school and a pool table. Chances are, if it was a place that a child would have snuck these tiny cars into at the groans of their parents, it was in the game. There were weapons occasionally too, with smashy hammers and mines amongst the hazards drivers could inflict on their opponents. It was a pretty good start to the world of racing games, but I knew I wanted more. It was fun, but why keep playing with toys? Video games could surely open me up to bigger and better racing experiences. And as if answering me, the official UK PlayStation magazine released a racing special, which I picked up. It then immediately threw me into a whole genre I'd never considered before, with practically every PlayStation racing game released in the UK by 1998 reviewed in one place. And of course, with these things, it also brought a demo disc that allowed me to play some of them too. And off this disc, there were three games that would become firm favourites. The first of these was a demo of Wipeout 2097, which would introduce me to the Wipeout series, represented here with 2008's Wipeout HD. And it's perhaps unsurprising that an arcade future racer with a bold aesthetic would be the game to transition me from kiddie racers to more serious fare. 
This series made you pay attention to it, with its in-your-face visuals and banging club soundtrack. I struggled a lot with the demo of 2097, but something drew me to eventually pick up the PS2 title Fusion, and later I'd get HD for the PS3. And I still struggled a lot, because Wipeout is a weird series. It's all sleek future racing with high speeds, fierce combat, twisty gravity defying tracks and a visual assault on the senses that can often be a lot to take in. But caught my issue with the series is its unique air brake system that requires you to brake on the left or right triggers accordingly while trying to maintain a high speed and avoiding smashing your hull on every wall in sight. To this day, I still can't quite get the hang of all of this, but I sure do have a lot of fun trying to make sense of it. I find I'm endlessly drawn to the series because of just how gorgeous its design is. I'm always a fan of bold art styles and Wipeout's flashy, sleek, designed by commercial graphic artists aesthetic is up there. It feels futuristic while also feeling pleasingly 90s at the same time, but somehow doesn't really feel dated either. And good god the soundtrack. If anything gives away Sony's strategy of marketing the original PlayStation at clubbers in the UK, it's Wipeout. Chemical Brothers, Future Sound of London, Prodigy, Orbital, Noisier and more beloved names in the EDM scene make up the vast majority of these games soundtracks. And while some of the other games can feel a little out of date due to how obviously 90s rave they are, it's hard to deny how much it can pump you up for some brutal future racing. And also for writing this script, because I put it on while writing and my efficiency went up by about 300%. In other words, not only was Wipeout responsible for transitioning me from Micro Machines to more serious racing games, it's also likely responsible for my love of electronic music as well. So, thanks for that. So Wipeout was the first game on that disc to catch my attention, but what was the second? I've already mentioned it once in this video, and it's a game almost universally praised and a series whose latest entry pretty much inspired the existence of this video because it's out this week. Yes, that game was the original Gran Turismo, a series whose only entries I've played have been the first and the fifth and yet I feel like I've played more for some reason. Going from arcade titles and headlong into the self-proclaimed real driving simulator was probably quite a leap, and yet here we are. Gran Turismo on the PS1 was excellent and convinced me that real-world races might also be fun. Gran Turismo is a fascinating experience for me as someone who isn't part of wider car culture because Gran Turismo thrives in that culture. It's a sleek, occasionally pretentious series that lights cars at tasteful angles, begs you to lovingly caress their bodywork, and plays smooth jazz in the menus to set the mood. It's car porn, but like, the classy kind, you know? Which isn't the appeal for me, of course, I'm just here for the articles. And by articles, I mean the RPG-style progression system, which is always what's weirdly interested me about the series. You always start the game as a lowly driver who isn't even licensed to enter races yet. And I'm sure anyone who's ever played a Gran Turismo game is now groaning at the mention of license tests, as you have to complete these intensely strict challenges where you have to take corners in a precise amount of time without a single mistake. And you must do this before you're even allowed to touch your first car. And your first car is always rubbish too. You start the game with a pitiful amount of credits, forcing you to the second-hand market to buy a pokey little hatchback that might get you to the shops in a decent amount of time, but feels wildly out of place on a racetrack. But then you win the slow Sunday Cup, earn some more credits, and then go out and spend all that money on newer and better cars, allowing you to enter bigger and better races until eventually you're running a real-time Le Mans race and drifting triumphantly around in a series of beloved Nissan Skylines. I've always enjoyed this, and even though I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing when it comes to tuning, I have a blast firing my way around these courses, winning like an absolute hero, and then going on to do even more. That is, until that sleek presentation starts to wear a bit, and I realise I'm just driving the same circuits over and over in cars that increasingly look like gaming mice. And then I get bored and I put the game away again. Clearly, I need something more exciting with my cars. Perhaps something with real-world cars, but with handling and progression that has more of an arcade sensibility. And this is where the third game on that demo disc comes in. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Before we get to that, however, I want to talk about my relationship to motorsports, which often isn't too far off my feelings with Gran Turismo. 
Formula One is the most prominent motorsport here in the UK, and while I certainly understand that it's hugely popular, it's also kind of boring to me. It's all about the meeting of driving skill and the technical wizardry under the bonnet that makes the machine so powerful. And while that's all very well and good, I'm less interested in the complex engineering of cars than in what they can do. Ultimately, to me, I just see Formula One cars as carving that obvious racing line into the tarmac for, uh, let me just check this. 78 laps. My god, I guess I've never really gotten out of the mentality of throwing toy cars around a living room and ramping them off everything inside because it's just cool. I want cars to do mad drifts, kick up dust and roar loudly as they do dumb but cool stuff. Luckily, there is a motorsport for me, rallying. I looked up the history of rallying for this video and it's wild. Just a bunch of rich gearheads in old horses carriages in the 1910s driving across Europe for a lark a bunch of wacky racist style competitions and a bunch of nutters in buggies flinging cars around the Mexican desert. But the most common form of rallying these days is a series of point to point races that take place in countries around the world from the snowy forests of Scandinavia to the muddy backroads of the UK. The World Rally Championship is an annual contest where drivers take affordable family hatchbacks, slap motorbike engines into them, and then throw them into forests and see who actually manages to get to the end. The lovingly crafted circuits of other motorsports are gone, replaced with dirt tracks of limited grip and the ever-present threat of crashing into a tree. I never knew this motorsport existed until I played the demo of Colin McRae Rally, the final game on that demo disc that introduced me to the world of racing games. And arguably the one that had the biggest impact on me because, my god, rallying is so much fun. Colin McRae Rally was an officially licensed game endorsed by a driver who'd earned the nickname of the Flying Scotsman because of just how wild his driving style was. The game itself ran through a year's championship, taking you on a country hopping tour from New Zealand through countries like Greece, Sweden, Australia and Indonesia, before finally settling back in the UK for the ultimate test of your skill. And it was so much fun, because unlike other racing sims, Colin McRae Rally felt like a globetrotting championship. In Gran Turismo, a circuit could be in Germany or Japan, but I absolutely wouldn't be able to tell because all the circuits kind of largely look the same. But in Colin McRae Rally, the scenery drastically changes from country to country, from the dusty tracks of Greece to the snowy alpine roads of Monte Carlo. And the driving is so much fun because rather than the monster cars designed to grip tight turns on tarmac, rallying encourages drifting because often it's the only way to get anything resembling grip. And jumps are frequent. It's often stressful because of the threat of hitting a barrier you can't see, but it's also satisfying when you roll your crumpled car over the finish line and your navigator compliments your driving skills. Great driving, we nearly did it. I enjoyed Colin McRae Rally so much that I would go on to play its two immediate sequels, but I dropped off the series at the fourth entry two games before the series rebranded and shifted its focus to become Colin McRae Dirt, the last game before McRae's tragic death in a helicopter crash in 2007. But I did come back to the series when PlayStation Plus provided Dirt 3, the first game to not bear McRae's name. And while it was fun, it wasn't quite the same as it used to be. It felt a bit stiff now, and while Dirt 5 has been on my radar for a while, I've never gotten around to playing it. There's always still been that itch for ludicrous car action that the early Colin McRae games provided, but I was never sure where I'd get it from again. Until now. Remember when I said earlier about Microsoft endlessly baiting and switching people with their racing games? The amount of times they show a lush landscape and then immediately turn off the hardcore gamers when a race barrels its way through. That's the Forza Horizon series, a spin-off from Xbox's answer to Gran Turismo, Forza Motorsport. And the first time the series caught my attention was when they announced an entry set in the UK. Seeing all these cars bombing it around the comically small streets of my home country appealed to me in a big way, and I knew I needed to play it. The problem is, I didn't own an Xbox, nor did I own a good enough PC at the time. And so, while there was an interest, I largely put it aside until I upgraded my PC a couple of years back and decided to get a Game Pass subscription. And then I kept staring at it in the menu, wondering if I should install it for the best part of a year. And then they announced Forza Horizon 5. And I was right there when it released and thought, I guess now is the time to jump in. And friends, I have not yet jumped back out. Forza Horizon 5 feels like a racing game designed specifically for my interests. 
It's a game about goofing around in cars and provides plenty of recognisable vehicles to goof around in. Like I said in my best of 2021 video, it's a glorious holiday to Mexico where everything is part of your playground to automotive excess. There's a mountain to fling cars off, there are gorgeous beaches to cruise across, jungles to crash through, ancient monuments to drift around, and a stadium that seemingly exists for you to kick a football around in your car. It also has four distinct race types, all of which fit into the wild, silly racing styles that appeal to me. Dirt and cross country are just straight up rallying, which is a big part of why my favourite selection is full of classic rally cars, and the street races are exactly the kind of need for speed drift nonsense you might expect, which is why the other half of my favourite selection is my Japanese street fleet, all Nissans and Mitsubishis with cultural signifiers like cherry blossoms and characters from Persona 5. There are road races, which are the closest the game gets to traditional circuit racing, but the persistent flashy festival vibe persists and makes them feel more like street races at day instead, which I'm okay with. And the festival playlist provides an endless cycle of new events that encourage me to try out different cars and roleplay as a superstar. Hell, this past month the game's been holding a World Cup where you pick a country and represent them with a set selection of cars from those countries. Which of course means I've spent the past month downloading any livery with a Union Jack on it and slapping them on every Corsa and Mini in sight. So what exactly keeps me playing it? What really is the appeal of all these racing games? Humanity has always loved competition. The first Olympics on record is dated at 776 BC, where displays of athletics and fighting prowess allowed competitors to push themselves to their limits and prove themselves to be the best. As time and technology moved on, people found new ways to test these limits and compete with each other. We learned how to ride horses and race those. We strapped chariots to the horses and raced those. And inevitably, as the invention of the motor vehicle in the late 19th century arrived, that drive for competition moved to these new vehicles. Automobile clubs sprung up across Europe as the owners of these newfangled machines found a new level of unprecedented freedom and could reach speeds that their frail human bodies couldn't manage alone. As the 20th century rolled on, cars became a dominant force, with society shaping around their presence with new roads, faster vehicles and a whole new culture forming around them. We began to see the introduction of racing circuits and teams as enthusiasts pushed these vehicles to their limits, turning the pokey horseless carriages of old into the roaring beasts of glorious power that we have today. And media followed this progress with excitement. Car chases became a common occurrence in movies, taking the excitement of the racetrack to the big screen, enhancing the excitement of a heist or a police officer tracking a suspect, or simply making a time machine look rad. So it was inevitable that video games, whose history is much younger than cars, would get in on the act too. Tracing the first racing game is actually really difficult, but it's often believed to be Indy 500, a game in the 1960s that used a rear projection screen, which would later turn into the likes of Atari Speedway, Namco's Pole Position, Sega's Hang On and Outrun, and would eventually lead into the vast array of Sims, Karts and Futurecraft races that we see today. And like all video games, the appeal boils down to the concept of being able to replicate something cool in a way that we can't do in real life. It's one thing to watch highly skilled drivers test their machines to their limits, but it's another thing entirely to be one of those highly skilled drivers. Because that's the problem, isn't it? Motorsports are expensive. Hell, simply owning a car for day-to-day -day life can be expensive. We can't all hire a crew of highly trained mechanics to beef up our Peugeots into something that would have us spraying champagne over a crowd of onlookers. We can't all afford a vast supply of gearboxes and tyres to replace the wear and tear of driving a vehicle incredibly fast. And when you almost inevitably crash, the cost of replacing that has to be through the roof. And, you know, the risk of death and injury that comes with that, of course. But then video games allow you to do this without the risk of that cost. You can experience the power, the speed and the tension of dragging a massive roaring steel box around corners at high speed, and we get to feel the danger of doing this without actually putting ourselves in real danger. As someone who has a lot of fun with racing games but gets anxious over taking lorries on the motorway in real life, it's certainly the appeal for me. The thing is, I'm not a typical car person. I have no interest in the mechanical side of cars at all. For me, the appeal of cars is what they can do and what they represent. Travel and freedom is one reason for my interest in being able to drive in real life, but in media, cars just have an air of cool about them. 
They have personality and movies and games have made a lot of effort to show this off. I love the mini because the Italian job makes me associate them with a goofy heist movie starring Michael Caine. The DeLorean is an infinitely cool car because everyone looks at it as the time machine from Back to the Future. And let's not forget how much of Aston Martin's image is wrapped up in James Bond turning their fleet of vehicles into cool spy cars. But this is why I'm much more in the camp of Forza Horizon instead of Gran Turismo. You can see this in my favourite selection in the game, which I boiled down to rally monsters including the Colin McRae cover cars, slick Japanese street cars, because you've gotta, and cool cars from media like the aforementioned Mini and DeLorean, and of course a drift-tuned Toyota Trueno that makes me want to blast Eurobeat every time I drive it. You know why. My current ongoing love of Forza Horizon 5 is what inspired this video, because it's the game that helped me understand why I sometimes glance curiously over at racing games and decide to try them out from time to time. I want to experience the wind in my hair, the challenge of holding a drift, the sense of competition and challenge, and most of all, find an excuse to fling a really expensive bit of kit through the air at high speed. And with its vast collection of cars, I can hop around different types and experience so many different ways of driving that I could only dream of in real life. And with absolutely no mechanical knowledge, these games allow me to experience all this without needing to pull out a Haynes manual. And yes, I had to look up what a Haynes manual is. That is what people love about racing games. Getting to live out that boyhood joy of driving toy cars across the carpet in a way that doesn't break the bank. And if you screw up and crash into a tree, you can just hit restart or use the rewind function of modern games. It's a simple joy and one that video games are more than happy to fulfil. In essence, fans of the genre never stopped being those kids who hyper-focused on toy cars for a couple of years, and that's all the justification you ever really need. Thank you for watching, I've been Bob the Pet Ferret and I hope you've enjoyed this look over some of the racing games that I've enjoyed in the past. Maybe leave a comment about some of the racing games you've enjoyed and what your thoughts are, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you're new to the channel. I'd also like to thank my patrons, whose names you can see on screen, and you can join them if you check out the link below in the description. Why not give some of these other videos a try as well if you've enjoyed this, and uh, yeah, I will see you again very soon with another video.